Welcome to part two, where I will finally address exactly what illiterate high school graduates like Antonio learned from the hidden curriculum, since they obviously did not learn from the explicit curriculum their teachers attempted to teach year after year after year. The mainstream of classroom schooling is organized to impose a curriculum that requires deliberate, effortful, and avoidable learning processes just like the process of seeing my face in the demonstration of the hidden curriculum in the first part of this video series. But a very important part of learning is automatic, unconscious, and impossible to avoid, just like seeing my nose while seeing the other parts of my face. The key element to notice is the fact that the curriculum is imposed. The manner of the imposition determines which volitional characteristics of the learning process are relevant. For some children, the imposition is invisible and does not present an issue because they are either personally glad to learn what is presented or are embedded in a cultural context in which that is simply an unquestioned fact of life, that people like them simply do that as part of being that kind of person. For those children, asking them to learn the curriculum is like asking them to not look at my face. They're making a valid choice whether or not they do it, because both options are, for them, equally choosable. The problem arises when children are in a context, either personally or culturally, that brings the imposition of the curriculum into their awareness as an imposition. When the imposition is perceived, then there are automatic, unconscious, and unavoidable psychological processes that make the request to learn that curriculum very difficult or impossible to comply with. Any random set of children who are subjected to an imposed curriculum can have volitionally opposite reactions, depending on whether or not their cultural and personal circumstances are appropriately aligned with the imposition and how it is presented. Thinking of schools from the perspective of society, it seems like we are simply making a perfectly reasonable request for all the children to learn what is taught. But for some children, our request is heard as the easy equivalent of stop seeing my face, while for other children, our request is heard as the equivalent of the impossible instruction to stop seeing my unobstructed nose while continuing to see other parts of my face. And when a conflict arises between the curricula, then the automatic, unconscious, and unavoidable psychological processes of the hidden curriculum will always overpower the deliberate, effortful, and avoidable processes required for learning the explicit curriculum. The hidden curriculum of imposed instruction has three systematic large-scale results. Dropping out, underachieving, and faux-achieving, which is when students go through the motions without mastering the material, these results are explained in detail in my educational policy video series. Schools routinely make behavioral demands of humans that many of those humans will either reject or not fully comply with because of the hidden curriculum of the three psychological needs. Every single human being is affected, no matter what age, gender, color, race, religion, sexual identity, or any other individual characteristic. This means that the harms associated with the hidden curriculum can negatively affect everyone. Both minority and majority populations, privileged and oppressed, teachers and students. Of course, it's worse for those with additional disadvantages, but these harms do not discriminate. When psychological needs are thwarted or neglected, then humans have automatic cognitive processes that make it impossible for them to learn or perform work as effectively or efficiently as possible. Remember, Unless special arrangements are made, it is impossible not to see my nose while you are already seeing my eyes, cheeks, and mouth. When teachers and students are systematically subjected to an environment that induces psychological distress due to the thwarting of their primary psychological needs, they will not be as effective and efficient as possible. I propose that there are actually three things that all experiences teach us humans, whether we are aware of it or not. These are the primary components of the hidden curriculum. One, how we manage our own and other people's behavior, which I refer to as power structures. Two, 
what and how we exchange with each other and our environment in order to meet our needs, which I call exchange processes. And three, the patterns of consciousness that result from being embedded in those particular power structures and exchange processes. Power structures, exchange processes, and patterns of consciousness. These are the essence of the hidden curriculum. These are the components of what responsible managers arrange in order to ensure that the human beings they manage can work effectively and efficiently. In schools, these are the components of what responsible teachers and principals arrange in order to ensure that their students and teachers can learn and work effectively and efficiently. And what is learned from the hidden curriculum is an attitude. So the answer to the question of what illiterate children like Antonio learn in school is that they learn an attitude. Let's consider attitude in detail for a moment. Literally, attitude means the orientation of an object in space. For instance, my body is in a literal physical attitude in relation to the camera, to the gravitational pull of the earth, or to whatever frame of reference we decide is relevant. Metaphorically, we use attitude to refer to the orientation of a mind to other minds, to a domain of activities, or to the world in which it is embedded. The attitude lessons illiterate students are taught might include the ideas that their interests and passions are irrelevant, that their needs are less important than the needs of teachers and more accomplished students, that their place in the power structure is at the bottom, and perhaps that reading, writing, and math are unpleasant and maybe even painful sources of trouble. So children, such as Antonio, do learn the most fundamental lessons that they are taught. They learn to occupy a particular place in the hierarchy of power relations. They learn to exchange certain kinds of behavior for attention or the lack thereof. And most of all, they become accustomed to the patterns of thought and action that result from being at the bottom of the hierarchy with those kinds of exchange options. Those lessons of the hidden curriculum preceded and overruled the explicit curriculum of symbol manipulation lessons, aka literacy, that their teachers attempted to impose. The power structures and exchange processes of schools and all human institutions are learned automatically, unconsciously, and unavoidably. The hidden curriculum teaches certain orientations of a mind to the situation in which it is embedded. What the chronically illiterate person experiences is a pattern. I call that pattern motivational amputation. They develop attitudes that are obstacles to directing their attention towards the symbol manipulation behaviors we call literacy. Those kids had their motivation to learn those skills systematically diminished. The school inadvertently cut them off from the very skills that they were supposed to be helping the students to engage with. Through a process of consistent association between literacy skills and the need thwarting demands by the situations they experience in school, the children learn that literacy is not a part of who they are since they always have to look to other kinds of activities for primary human need satisfaction. This brings me to the key point of all of my work in education. Teach kids attitude first. You might interpret that statement as a suggestion, but the truth is that it is a fact of life that you are already teaching attitude first because there is no other option. However, I do have a suggestion. My suggestion is to put as much or more time into designing and refining your hidden curriculum as you put into your explicit curriculum. But let's face it, power structures, exchange processes, and patterns of consciousness may be an elegant set of conceptual categories, but they don't give you a practical sense of what you should be working on in your designing and refining process. In the third episode, I propose to solve the mystery of what exactly it is that is lurking unseen in classrooms that can, despite everyone's best intentions, still systematically cause bad 